Oh man, I gotta get my drink. Hey, hello, welcome to God's family room. We're gonna get started. Tonight we're gonna be talking about speaking the truth in love. I pray to God that you guys will receive this message. And what we're doing with speaking the truth in love is we're doing this for one purpose, and it's for building or maybe rebuilding relationships. Amen? Who wants to do that? Okay, we got a few people. That's untrusted. <laughs> All right, so tonight is such a, isn't it a beautiful, blessed evening, this weather and everything that we're still having? And I thank God that we still get to be here on earth together, praising God. Amen? Amen. And God's going to give us tools. He's always given us tools that he wants to bring about correction and growth. And that's what we're talking about, too. When we have correction and growth, these are principles that will allow us and other people that are in our lives that they also, besides that, we get to experience the natural consequences of our actions. A lot of people don't get to experience the natural consequences of their actions, and that next week will be the last part of it, is because next week we're gonna talk about aiding and abating. But tonight it's not. So I'm just saying we have actions and people need to know that um, in our lives and in our friends' lives and our family's lives, we don't always get to experience because we try to stop it. We get in the way of God where God can't bring judgment in somebody because we're too busy trying to play God. And that's why people die and go to hell too. Just tell them the truth, sorry. <laughs> I hate it. So why is this so important? It's because God has a very natural refining process as we continue to grow and mature as his dear children. So tonight, Wes is going to tell us the verse here. And we're going to learn together about the benefits of his laws of sowing. Remember we talked about sowing and reaping? So we're going to learn a benefit tonight of sowing so we can reap a good harvest in our relationships. Okay? Amen? Amen. Cool. All right. Throw away. Party start. Go ahead. <laughs> Ephesians 4.15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is it, which is the head, even Christ. Awesome. So that, that's a really important verse that he's talking about to us. We are supposed to speak the truth. And what did he say? All things. What did you say? Love. And love. Yes, we're going to speak the truth in love. It doesn't say speak the truth in hate. Does it say speak the truth in anger? Ah, bite your face off. It says you are supposed to speak the truth in love. In order to speak the truth in love, a good portion of the reason why we don't speak in love is because we're going to talk about it. We get too emotional and we let our emotions like flare up and make our hair stand up on the top of our head. <laughs> our blood's boiling. But you need to take two steps, take a breath, and you need to calm down. And you need to realize that God's telling us, if you speak the truth to somebody in love, change your tone, you will grow to become every aspect in the respect as a mature body of him. That means you are naturally going to change people because you see people say, man, you do follow Christ. He is the head of your life. You're not just saying it. I see it in you. Don't you want that kind of a testimony? Me too. So what is this verse is teaching us? It's teaching us how to speak in love. And it's the first thing of my husband and my book we've been writing. It's called communication. So we have to start communicating with the truth. Amen? Who wants to communicate with the truth? Because let me tell you, write a little note to yourself so you'll never forget this. Okay? Write this little note. Hiding is lying. 
case you didn't know. If you're hiding anything from anybody, you're a liar. So hiding is like So we speak what? Truth. Amen. We speak the truth. Now, when he says to speak the truth in love and he wants us to communicate to people, if you're taking any notes, you want to make sure you're communicating in such a way that is kind. And if you have a hard time being kind, lower your voice. Get into your soft voice. That, when you do that, then you become gentle. And when you're kind and gentle, then you are non-threatening. And that's Christ, how he does business as. This is how, when you listen to the message tonight, and if you really want to build an amazing relationship, this is God telling us how to do it. We're speaking this truth, and a lot of times people don't speak the truth. Not, it's true, we don't. And why do we not speak the truth? Does anybody want to share why? Why do we not always tell the truth to people that we want to be honest? Because of? The fear response. That's right. Because of fear. He said fear. What else? Manipulation, yeah, Julie said. What else? Why do we not always speak don't the truth? Don't want to hurt your feelings. Sure. Don't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> Rejection, right? Sometimes we just don't know how to speak truth either. Because we're always living in fear. Right? Okay. Well, I've got a great verse for you that I want you to mark in your Bible. It's 1 John 4.19. Who has that? Okay, go ahead and read that, Julie. We love him because he first loved us. Simple. That's my son's, my son's very first memory verse my mother taught. Isn't that something? Yeah. Say it again, loud and clear. We love him because he first loved us. We love him. Because he first loved us. Isn't this a great, amazing verse to keep us plugged into God's character? If you'll always remember, we love him because he first loved us. It keeps me humble when I read that verse. You know, I think so often how he knew exactly who I was going to be. Yeah. He knew all my sin. He knew all my imperfections. Yet he still did. He still loved he did you. when he did it. Yeah, that's true, Pastor. So... When you keep this verse on your mind, it plugs you into the characteristics of God because you start to base all your knowledge on knowing on how he first loved us. Then you realize because he was going to be our savior. Like he said, if he loved us, he knew he had to die for us, but he still went ahead and died for us. We have a hard time dying for people we love, though. we got to get back at them. You little, hmm, you, I'm not going to talk to you no more. Yeah. And you know you love them, but you're, you're being stubborn. But when you know that you want to have the characteristics of godliness, where you know God's going to win, never forget God is love. That's it. What is God? Love. He's love. Now, when you find out that somebody can't forgive you ever, maybe they don't know God. Because God promises forgiveness is the key to getting the kingdom, remember? So, when you see, here's God, and he, and he loved us first, and he's going to do all these things for us, what happens is it changes your heart, and it makes you capable to love. Because here's a guy, he didn't have to die, he didn't have to do that, did he? He didn't have to go to hell for us. We should, we deserve to go to hell. But that makes you think, man, if he did that for me, imagine what you could do and what you're capable of if you just do it for God anyways. Forgive him anyways. Love your enemies anyways. Pray for those that are out of control. Listen, according to this, love, by which here God, he covers us because he says we are to love others. And when you start to think about how to love others, well, 
First of all, you gotta, the only way you can love others is with grace. Did God give grace, shed his grace for us? Then he tells us you got to be selflessness. Does anybody know what selflessness is? Selflessness means that you're always thinking of their needs, her needs, the pastor's needs, my best friend's needs, all your all needs before I think of myself. And that shows that you are being truthful on loving somebody. Because you're speaking in truth when you just say, you know what, I know, I'm not saying you're supposed to, do it all the time, but I'm saying, you know when the Holy Spirit's telling you to do that. Lay down your life because you know that God's telling you to love somebody and even though you don't want to. Now the reason God, this is a really tricky one. <laughs> this is tricky for us. <laughs> the reason God has placed us with certain people in our life, guess what it's for the purpose of? What? Yeah, but it's for love. <laughs> We're supposed to love them. Yeah. Maybe they never got love the way you're going to love them. That's a purpose. And guess what we're supposed to do is we love them. This is something that we're learning is you're supposed to encourage and cheer for holiness to take place. Do you know what it means to cheer for somebody for holiness to take place? What do you think that means, Ron? Love. What do you think it means to cheer somebody on for them to take holiness place, to take holiness in their life that will take place in their life? What does that mean? <laughs> Trick question, but. Well, it means you're, you're doing right. You're supporting that person. Yeah, you're supporting them. You're, you're helping, maybe not doing anything to really help them, but you're consciously lifting them up. Yeah, you're lifting them up. Because when you're cheering them up, when you see cheerleaders, hey, whoop, 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 your cheerleaders, you know, they go beat, go eat, whatever the name of the company is. What are they cheering for? Team. The team. So if you're cheering for your team, and are you all on the same team? Oh, good. Then that means you're supposed to cheer for everybody that says they love the Lord. Well, they're not supposed to be doing this, and they're not supposed to be doing that. Yeah, well, you God sees what you did and how you talk like that, too. <laughs> See, if you're taking notes, encouragement is love. When you cheer people on, even though you don't want to, that means you're loving them. And you don't have to maybe say nothing to them, but you can pray for them, right? That's more love than anything. Because today, in this world we live in, life is constantly facing us with decisions that are testing our character, is testing our values, and is testing even our abilities to discern right from wrong. So there's sometimes, you know, we get a lot of tension from other people. So we have to separate wisdom from our emotions. So, like, we don't feel like loving and cheering on these loved ones that we used to love because they made you mad as hell over here. Isn't it easy to quit praying for your enemies? Let's see what happens when um, Matthew 5, 44 shows up in our life. Does anybody have that one? Okay, who would like to look it up? <laughs> I didn't put that on my paper. Whoever has it, just read it out. What, what number was it? It's whoever can look up Matthew 544 and just read it for me, please. <laughs> but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's hardcore, isn't it? But is that a commandment from God? That's right. So your emotions change one day. One day you love, one day you don't. But he's telling us to never stop praying, especially for your enemies. I always say, you know that you're doing what God tells you to do when you love your enemies triple. Don't just love them. Love them triple. That means you're praying for them. If you see them, you hug them first. 
And if you if you can buy them lunch, you see them, you do that. You don't avoid them. That's what I do, just because I think it's more fun. Because when we must use this wisdom, because you're making decisions on how to work things out. I'm not saying if somebody came along and you know cut down your like trees and then you go over buy them gifts. I'm talking like you use wisdom to take more time to reflect on what you're saying and instead of speaking your whole minds to that person because you want to make sure when you do speak that you speak with God's characteristics. And this is what happens. The big problem is when our trust has been broken, we always let our emotions take over and that is not wise to do. Watch what James says James 1, 1 through 3. Is that you, Steph? Watch what it says. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Amen. Go ahead, Brother Tim. Can you read the rest? <coughs> Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like the wind of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Amen. So if you mark that down, that's James 1, 1 through 6. And what, the, what it's telling us, you're prioritizing wisdom over your enemies. And how do you prioritize this wisdom over your enemies? Well, I'm going to tell you what you do. This is wisdom to know when it's time to bless and release them to God. That's, that's wisdom. So what does that mean? I wish you well. And you let them go. You have to sometimes separate yourself. You have to change your life because it's detrimental to your health. It's hurting you. It's killing you. When you do this type of wisdom, you get an understanding that you're not no longer being ran by the emotions because your emotions are causing you a problem. Like when you even go around giving people other chances, like a second chance, after you already pray, you already asked God what you're supposed to do the situation. Well, will giving them a second chance be likely to lead to a positive change? Or will it result, result in more harm? Like, is it, is it bringing things, like you're in agreement, you're moving forward? Or you see every time you say you're moving forward, then the next five seconds, it's the same. So... True wisdom is compassionate, but guess what? It's also firm. That means you're a wise person if you can stand firm on what you said you're going to do. Even if it's disciplining your children or, um, you know, like you're watching your nieces and nephews, you better follow through with what you say you're going to do. Why? Because that's called love. You are recognizing that love sometimes also means saying N O. Hell no. <laughs> because no means that you are setting boundaries that you're protecting your well being. Anybody have any questions about that? Do you understand what we're talking about so far? Okay. Anybody have any questions about saying no? Asking God for wisdom, he'll give it to you so liberally. But you ain't going to get wisdom when you're not asking for wisdom. I think a lot of people need to understand that saying no is not selfish. Right. And that yeah. you're, um, and that's, hey, if it's probably easier to understand this hey, one, it's okay to be selfish you know, if you're honest about where you're yeah. at, you know? Well, we're going to so, talk about that. So here we have to use wisdom, okay? Now listen, get this in your head right now. What do you say? You're going to give wisdom. You're going to use wisdom. You're going to use wisdom by giving a second chance, or you're going to give a third chance, maybe a 
fortune with accountability. Got it? Does it make sense? How does that work? Accountability means you're going to make sure that you and the other person are going to accept responsibility to own it. You're going to own your own wrongs. I didn't do that. No, I didn't say that. I'm not going to be that. All right, go ahead. Well, again, I think that um, I know myself as a pastor and always asking people to help somewhere. I'd much rather hear a no and have it be an honest <laughs> no than to have, say, yeah, I'll be there. And I'm waiting have no for three hours for yeah. you to show up, right? So, I, so uh, it, 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 is, it is genuine wisdom and love. It's wisdom on your part, and no one should be offended for you being honest. You should never be afraid of being honest. Yeah, because otherwise love, guess, uh, love is not present. You, you mean when you can't be honest, it's not present, and you're doing a disservice to both you and them when you can't hold somebody accountable. Why? Because here we learned last week, it's in the Bible, God tells us to be good and wise stewards of our relationships because God gave you that relationship and he'll take them away from you or her. Why? Because you're not trusting God. You're going to see in a minute like, how God works because this is what's called the kingdom of God. And Jesus, he shows us when he used to, he always used to show us, and he shows us in the Bible, when he uses mercy and he holds people accountable. Now, Jesus, when he's on the earth, he didn't allow his emotions to dictate his actions. Instead, he was always guided by the wisdom of God's will and purpose. That's why you always find him up in the mountains or in the bushes praying and talking to his father. And then he'd come out and he'd say, well, I'm going to do what my father tells me to do. No matter what's going on. Go ahead. Who reads Proverbs 4-7? Uh, Go wisdom. ahead, Julia. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all that getting, get understanding. Good. Thank you so much. So if wisdom is the principal thing, so what does that mean? That means when you use wisdom because you're praying and you're waiting for God to give you an answer, that means you're going to get comprehensive. You're going to be comprehending what to do. And you're going to have an ability to go and apply that knowledge because wisdom is going to guide us into a living a life the way God intends us to live. And it's, not, it's so important to understand there's a skill to godly living. It doesn't just come upon you. You have to decide every morning to keep your mouth shut sometimes, right? It's not speak your whole mind because you're mad or you don't feel good and it's like the devil's just waiting. What are you going to say today so I can do that to you? You'll see that in a minute. So when you choose wisdom of what God says to do over emotion, then you're aligning yourself with God's principles. It's because wisdom is the principal thing. When they say the principal thing, that means like it's the number one thing that you can do in your life to become a godly steward, a godly characteristic, a person that's living godly. That's what he's telling us. Now, when you acknowledge that while emotions are really important, we have a lot of emotions, but they're not always reliable guides for making decisions that have lasting consequences. Am I right? So wisdom is going to help protect our heart so you can avoid this unnecessary pain and regret. Now we have to pray when our trust has been violated and our trust has been broken because if we don't pray, we're not going to be able to go back and do the right thing. But if we pray, that means we can reflect and we can go and get consultation from the word of God. That, my friends, is wisdom, not stupidity. Anything else you do, anything else you don't understand, you're going to be stupid about the situation because we go back to the principles of what God tells us to do. Now, wisdom is when you're making choices that honor God. You honor God first with your life. You honor God with what you're going to do. And when you make this wisdom choice to honor God and you be the man that God made you to be or you be the woman that 
God made you to be, then you're respecting yourself. And if you respect yourself, then you can actually go out and start to build healthy relationships with everybody you meet. Otherwise, you lose your integrity if you can't use wisdom. Wisdom makes you really graceful because you start trusting other people with confidence, confidence, and you, come a, you become a person with integrity. That means um, you actually have a moral uprightness about yourself, like naturally. And when you want to know what integrity means, that means it's the quality of being honest. You have very strong moral principles. You don't let anybody talk you into anything ever that's outside of God's will. You just don't do it. They'll be talking, maybe trash, and do That's okay, you can do whatever you want, but it's not for me. I have moral principles, and I'm going to stay right here and be that light and pray that your light comes on. Now, trust comes next. <laughs> trust is the number one thing, right? After you become wise, then you start to trust people. Well, let me tell you what trust is going to do. If you want to reconnect with people, trust will give us a genuine connection and a very lasting relationship. But if you can't trust somebody, you will, you will definitely have no foundation. It will fall. Let me show you what's going to help, help us. Trust. No matter where they're at, what they're doing. Trust is the glue that holds relationships together. Now, watch what's going to happen right now. Here we go, buddy. Proverbs 27, 17. Mr. Ron, he's going to read the verse and then he's going to read something in just a second. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Did you hear that? Iron sharpens iron. Sorry, I'll switch it over. <laughs> no, I'm just still using iron it. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. So what is this talking about? The scripture is emphasizing the role of accountability and helping us grow stronger and wiser. Because here's the truth. The truth is that people affect one another. Even if, even if the people don't, like you don't hear them and they're behind closed doors, let me tell you something. People are going to be affecting one another with your words and your actions. And then it starts to define the relationships for either better or for worse. Now this iron sharpening iron and it's going to help the countenance of his friend. This is what's changing people. So people, when you're trying to get somebody like to figure out what's going on, you need somebody that you value, that you believe that they're wise too. You need to ask for wisdom from them. And but you on the other part, that's what this means, is you need to receive it well. That's the problem. Nobody ever wants to hear the truth about themselves, right? But when one man, he sharpens another man, or one woman sharpens another woman, is when people are helping to refine each other through interaction. And when, you're, when you want to refine each other through interaction, this is what happens. It becomes like a constructive conflict, which is called constructive criticism. Now, Brother Ron, read, read something what construction, listen what this means, constructive criticism. Constructive criticism is a form of feedback that focuses on delivering critique and negative feedback constructively and positively to improve performance or behavior. Constructive criticism is actionable, clear, and beneficial to the recipient. Did you hear that? Okay, so I'm just going to, you don't have to tell me, but how many people had asked somebody for some help, but you didn't like what they said to you? Okay. Well, let me tell you something. How many people, the person you asked, you love them and you respect them? Okay. So this is very, very, very important. You need to start listening with yourself with love. 
This is what's going to change the society into a nation that's going to fear the Lord. Because you no longer, if you can't even trust a man to tell you what you're doing wrong, you'll never be able to move forward in the ministry. Maybe God even has for you. Now, listen. All of this we're talking about, Brother Ron telling us, is done in a positive tone. Not like, you know what? You suck really bad, man. <laughs> <laughs> so wait a minute. So don't take it personal. Why? You want me to tell you why? Because it's done with a positive tone and you're keeping an open mind. Go ahead. You want to say something? Right, again, we, we think we too often forget that God designed us with two ears and one mouth. And so the, the, the strength of what, you know, what you're saying, brother, is that we have to, that we listen with love and that if we respond to what we're listening to, um, we'll be better off for it because it was said, not because they said it. We don't agree with it because we're just fighting the fact mm -hmm. that we have to hear twice as, twice as strong as we, we speak back and respond well, to it. You know? this is the problem. If you love someone, if, if you say you love someone, then you allow the someone to that you love and you allow them to be wise and strong in your life Guess what that's called? True accountability. You are a true, accountable person to me. I can trust you to tell me what I look like if I ask. Or even sometimes you might say, can I talk to you for a minute? Because you love me. Well, then your response, your response is respectful. Yeah. And, and when your response is respectful rather than contention, it just builds the relationship. All, it leads yeah. into a fabric that you can't break. But see, what is this called? What I'm talking about, what Brother Ron's telling, iron sharpening iron is the only purpose is, is so the body of Christ can build and the kingdom can grow because you're holding people accountable. What's wrong with that? Why do we get so offended? Like, this is where you know that you have an open and you're very um, minded person who is saying, I'm willing to grow. Are you willing to grow? Like, do you, this should encourage us to live up to our highest potential because you have set a standard to allow people to tell you how they feel. Boy, wouldn't we have a different world if we could do that? Listen, and you know what type of blood you would be having running through your veins? What, you know what type you have? Be positive. <laughs> you know what when they say what's your blood type be positive that's who I am <laughs> so <laughs> I do have big blood so why is it so hard to ask or not to ask somebody for constructive criticism like brother Ron taught us tonight why is it so hard because you don't want to hear their answer <laughs> <laughs> but why not if that made you a better person, wouldn't you want to hear it? Well, I think it's a proof of love because we're so much, we're filled with such disrespect for each other mm -hmm. that we don't think someone could actually say something that could improve on yourself, which is arrogance. Yeah. Which is, you know, that attitude, God says, be ready for your next fall because yeah. that arrogance is going to lead you to yeah. your pride. Your pride is going to make you fall on your nose and then you're really next to yeah, like I respect my friends and my children and Dawn and Renee and, you know, people that I'll ask them things and they'll tell me how it is. And I listen. And we always want to, oh, but wait a minute, you know, but I'm just telling you something. Don't listen to this quote. Does anybody want to share why else? Why else? Like, why is it so hard to ask somebody for constructive criticism? Or because you're trying to build yourself and be a better you. Why is it, anybody else want to shift? Because I want to cut you out. I mean, it's just because you're just afraid of what they're going to say, but, you know, and then your first reaction is to defend yourself. Yes. But then, you know, I, I mean, it's good. I like destructive criticism. Yeah. I do, too. It's hard to take. It's sometimes hard to hear, but. Mm hmm Yeah, so don't start lining up and write me a bunch of letters. <laughs> 
I get back to you shortly. <laughs> well, listen, <laughs> listen to this such, if this doesn't change your mind, you'll never have a changed mind about what I'm teaching you right now. You ready for a powerful quote? Listen, this is the best quote I've ever heard in my entire life. The trouble with most, most of us is that we would rather be ruined, like ruined, like ruined, by praise than saved by criticism. Say it again. The trouble with most of us is we would rather be ruined by people praising us, that ruins us, than saved by criticism. I love it. And that's a man named Norman um, Vincent Peel, he wrote a book, The Power of Positive Thinking. I just ordered it today for myself so I can be more B plus positive. So guess what, though? Guess this thing we're talking, this is not about punishment. It's about growth and it's about improvement. And when you want to grow and you want to improve, then you are in alignment with God's will. Now, I'm sure people don't understand the pastor and I sometimes. They'll come and ask us for help, and I see their faces start to change. <laughs> you know, and, I, and I'm like, listen, I'm just telling you what the principles of God are saying. And it's, it's something we've already experienced in our lives, maybe, because we've studied the Word of God. We're not trying to be a dictatorship, and this is not a dictatorship. Somebody trying to dictate to you, telling you what to do. It's just supposed to be wise counsel, wise wisdom, because it's going to improve the lives of those who need answers. So when someone wrongs you and breaks your trust, accountability is the mechanism that's going to ensure that they understand. You know what? There's a seriousness of your actions. Okay? So what does that mean? You're telling them, I want to make sure I hold you accountable. I'm going to make sure the seriousness that I'm not going to let you continue to keep going and saying you're going to change and you don't. And this is why it'll separate from generous being remorseful or mere regret. So regret, it always leads to sometimes you'll get an apology, but true accountability, when you are truly ready to hold somebody accountable for their actions, it's going to lead to a change and maybe not just their behavior, but maybe yours too. Because you're saying, I am see you're ready to do this now. So guess what? The requirement for this individual, it goes beyond words when you start to demonstrate through the actions and there's no more re, um, reactions. Because a lot of people, like Renee saying, you know, they start to react and defend themselves, but they start to start lying. Oh, no, I didn't. Oh, I don't think so. Well, no, I'm trying to tell you what you look like. You got a big black hair coming down your nose. Well, I don't see it. Well, I do. You see what I'm saying? Um, you got to realize that the only purpose is you're wanting to hold people accountable because you want to make sure you're committed that they're doing better because you want to be doing better, right? So stop allowing bad behavior. When you keep tolerating bad behavior, you're seeing mistakes are being made constantly and they're being repeated because you don't hold people accountable. And when you don't hold people accountable, you're hindering people from growing and learning from their mistakes. And what happens is if you will learn to just be like, maybe not that minute, maybe the next day, or maybe a week from now, you sit down and have a coffee with them, you're gonna develop characteristics and strengthen their integrity because you're being honest to not only yourself, but to everybody in your life when you do this. Watch Romans 14, 12 real quick. Who has that? So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. That's it. We're going to be held accountable for our actions before God, Sean said. So guess what this means? You're going to be held accountable to God. You're not going to be held accountable to man, but you're supposed to use your life before man to honor God. This is not meant to be a burden. You've got to walk around worrying about who you're offending and people are offending you, but you're using this as a guiding force that's keeping us on the path of righteousness 
before God because you see somebody, you see what they're doing wrong, and you know you're not holding them accountable, let somebody else tell them. Now this is all a reminder that every one of our actions have consequences. That's what Sean's saying too. Because we're responsible how we live our lives and your spouse, your kids, your church, friends, and family, they're not going to be standing before the Lord. You're going to be one-on-one, -on -one, just you and God. So when you're being held accountable, you're, you're holding people accountable for an encouragement because you're making responsibility to make amends. Because without them, you know what you do? You never speak to them again. You're not friends with them no more. I, don't, I hate that person. You used to love them. But when you give mutual respect when you make amends because you're trusting that you would want them to do that for you, right? Like I, you do unto others as you want them to do unto you, amen? So on the other hand, when accountability is absent, our relationships are becoming so toxic. So when you don't have consequences, you're causing great harm. You're causing abuse and betrayal. That means you're being disloyal and you're constantly stabbing people in the back or they're stabbing you in the back. And that is not a, it's not a strong foundation for you to live your life on. It's going to just wither away and it's going to erode and it's going to just be like the sand. It's going to fall right into the sea and be lost. It's going to be forgotten. But God put people in our life for a purpose. God put us together for a reason. So I'm just saying, please make others accountable so you yourself will be healthy, you'll be well and whole without regret. Now I want to show you something. I want to show you God's infinite wisdom and how strong God told us some stuff in the Bible. I'm going to tell you two things. God chose to do things to those he loved and he used their story to teach us even tonight. He shows how to be accountable and he showed consequences I keep saying the consequences. <laughs> hey, let me quench you up, baby. Consequences for their actions. How many people remember the story of Moses and the rock? Okay, watch what happens. After he's leading the Israelites through that old nasty wilderness for many years, Moses was instructed by God to go speak to a rock to bring forth the water. If you want to know what this is found, I'll tell you later. So in his frustration, Moses, he struck the rock twice with his staff. And although the water did come out, Moses disobeyed God's direct command. He didn't follow God's instruction. Instead, he said, God, this is what God said. He said, tell the rock before their eyes to yield water. And um, Moses said, you know, Mo that's what God told him. To, but this is what Moses said. Mo Moses said this. Now you rebels shall bring forth that water out of this rock. That's what he said in the Bible. That's not what God told him to say. So here's Moses. He led these people. And as a result, God did not let him lead the Israelites into the promised land. Do you see how pride got in the way? Think you're better than everybody else? He did not get a second chance. He, God did not allow him to correct his mistake. And the Lord said, because you did not believe in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land, which I have given it to them. But see how you could stop people's blessing ourselves? Because you don't want to do what God's telling you to do either. Me either. Well, here's a story showing the importance of we are to be obedient and the reality that even leaders, if you're a leader, even if you're a leader at your work, you are going to be held accountable for your actions, for what you do and how you represent Christ. God wants us to be men and women with integrity. He wants us to be honest for his name's sake because everywhere you go, God's with you. So you're representing him. Amen? Here's another story from God. The story of Lot's wife is a powerful illustration of what God has done. Watch what God was doing. Here's God. <coughs> Destroying Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and sulfur because of their sexual wickedness, including rape, 
child sex abuse, indecent assault against children, homosexuality, and this was an abomination to God. Then he gave Lot instructions, and Lot was Abraham's nephew, and he told his family these clear instructions, do not look back. <laughs> Guess what happened? They start to flee that wicked city. However, here goes wife, Lot's wife. She looks back, and she turns in to a pillar of salt. Instantly. No second chance. No opportunity for her to escape the consequences of her disobedience. So this, to me, is a story, it's a harsh reminder that sometimes the consequences of our actions, God bless you, are immediate, they're so immediate, and they can't be reversed. One more story. This one will shock you. She needs a blanket. One more story of Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. They had some property, and they lied to Peter about the sell of a piece of the property. They pretended to give all the money to the apostles. This is in the Bible. I can show you where it's at. But they secretly kept a portion for themselves. And when they were confronted by Peter, Peter said, hey, um, where's that money you guys made the sell of the property? I thought you sold it for this much. Oh, no, no, we didn't. And they were struck dead immediately. Died. The, they, they concealed the truth about the money that God gave them to use about building the kingdom of heaven. From that story, we start to learn that all when we all should be giving, you know, everything we give is for God's glory. It's for the, not the earthly praise. Because no matter how much money you have in the bank and you don't want to give it to God, you don't have to give it to God. But if God's telling you to do it, just say, right? No second chance there. No opportunity for repentance. This story is showing the seriousness of lying to the Holy Spirit because that force of sin within the community of believers. People would rather hold on to their sinful thoughts the way they believe it's supposed to be instead of listening to what God's telling us. These are biblical examples. And they're teaching while God is so loving, God is merciful, he's forgiving, and he also shows a reflective side to him that if you don't want to listen to God and you want to keep doing things our way and not, you know, he's, yeah, he's forgiving, but he's showing us that he's a just God and he does not take sins lightly when you're walking around saying you are holy and you're being unholy. I don't know what judgment's going to come on us. But I don't want it. <laughs> and that's showing us there's times that he's withholding another chance because he's withholding his righteousness. And he covers us with his righteousness, right? But we want his face not to be against us for doing evil. So he's teaching us the seriousness of the choices that we're making. Every action is going to have a consequences. And we should always approach every decision with a deep responsibility because we want to reverence God's command that he's telling us to do it. Not to discourage us. It's to guide us towards a life that God has called us to. This life is like a vapor, man. Once you're out and somebody's dropping dead, it's like you're gone. That's it. You can't change anything. Because when you live according to the consequences of your own free will, of your, all your choices, you're not taking serious to understanding. You've got to take actions. Because when you take action, all you're doing is saying, you're not going to do that no more. I'm going to honor God by his principles, and I'm going to be accountable to God, and I'm going to make my relationships accountable, and I'm not going to let people just treat me like a piece anymore. I'm not going to be a doormat anymore. Because you're always going to protect this. And we're done. You're going to protect your peace. Don't let nobody rob you of your peace. That's how you've got to remove conflict by standing with God and you're trusting God's plan. And I know um, we have to stop allowing people to steal our peace. Who has Philippians 4-7? We're almost done. Philippians 4-7. Oh, sorry. That's me. <laughs> That's and the peace of God, which 
passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So here's the peace of God that you'll never be under, able to understand. The people will look at you and say, how in the world are you getting through that, Laura? Because you got the peace of God on you. How in the world can you make it through that horrific situation? Because I trust God. That's what she's saying. You're choosing prayer. You're trusting God during the times of anxiety and you're experiencing this peace of God because you ain't worried about anything anymore. Instead, you pray and you believe God about everything. You're telling God what you need. And then we're going to talk about going to sleep now. It's time to go get home and go to sleep. <laughs> I'm going to let you guys go early, so I'm not going to finish my message, but I'm going to finish it next week. But I just want you to know that tonight, let's bow our heads and ask God to bless this message and what we're learning about being accountable, training our minds to hold people accountable, and learn to receive constructive criticism and it's to sharpen each other so we can grow and become who we need to be. Amen? Amen? So Lord, tonight, please guide us and change us and give us your heart, Lord. Give us your heart to love others as the way you love them. And let the world around us see Christ in us. Lord, give us wisdom to make decisions that's going to bring peace into our lives and because we want peace not into our lives only, but into our children and our family and our friends' lives. Lord, allow us to have this peace so we can live a healthy, blessed life. Change us and move us into what you have called us to be a light in this dark world. And let us to never be taken advantage of anymore. And let us to stand for the truth and be wise in how we speak to others. And we give you all the glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching.